Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited to share with you our first webinar of our four-part webinar series. Um, tonight, we're um, lucky to have Dr. Viviana Hernandez as our host, and she'll be talking about understanding, understanding equine lameness. We're going to have everyone muted and your screens um, shut off um, throughout the presentation. We are gonna do questions at the end and to ask a question just at the bottom of the screen, there's a chat box. So you're able to insert your question into the chat box and um, Dr. Viviana is happy to answer it at the end. Otherwise, thanks so much again for joining us and I'm gonna pass it along to Dr. Viviana. Thank you, Karen. So, well, welcome everyone. This is the first series of a, this is the first talk of a series of talks that we're going to be doing here at Mackie Panel. Um, so my topic today is it's just a brief understanding of lameness. I know it's a topic that can be a, a confusing for owners, especially when you're not so used to see a horse move. And sometimes I, I had the situation where I had clients looking at me and saying like, how are you even able to see it? Well, it's just about getting used. So the plan today is to give you a base so you can actually see what we're looking when we're doing a lameness exam, okay? Um, if someone has their microphone on, I can ask you, please, can you turn it off? It's It just makes a lot of noise <laughs> on the background, okay? So let's start with this. Payoffs for locals and truckers alike. Perfect. Okay. So, well, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy. So, how many bones do you think a horse has? Like a big number, like between how many? 100, 200, 300? Well, the reality is that the horse has around 205 bones. That means that there's a lot. And all those bones can have pain. All those bones have, have issues. And this is it. This is just the base of how the horse stands. This is the, just the base, the foundation of our horse, the bones. Um, we have long bones. We have short bones. We have ones that actually carry the weight. The, only, the other ones that just give support. We have um, the ones that protect... Uh, like the rib cage, and all of these bones are important. Like we can have some sort of lameness caused by just some um, coastal bone, sorry, coastal pain, or uh, just like the limb part area. So we have the bones. Now we go to the soft part of the body. How many muscles a horses have? They have around seven hundred. And I'm not talking about the ligament and the tendons. Those ones are like the strings that connect everything and just make the movement go, just like the puppets. This is just a, an example of one of the like the common muscles that we have. We have the, the gluteal, we have the, uh, the neck muscles, we have um, like, there's a lot of them. Like I can spend hours and hours and hours of just explaining to you the different muscles and the different work that they do. But I just want you to understand a horse is not just the horse. We have bones, we have ligaments, we have tendons, we have muscles. All of them work in a specific way. And if we have one that has something, all of the other structures in the horse's body are going to start working just to release the pain or just to protect that area and make the horse be comfortable and be able to move around. We need to remember horses in nature, they are the food. They are not the ones that eat the other animals. They are the ones that are eaten. So they need to be able to escape, to be moving all the time. In nature, a horse spends 18 hours of the 24 hours a day just eating. And they only rest between, like resting, when I say resting, like lay down to sleep between 30 minutes to an hour and they don't do it like in a constant like in just one time they do it like in small laps of time so because remember if they stay quiet for a long time that means that they're easy for food 
So for understanding lameness, we need to understand the biomechanic of the movement uh, of the horse. So what are the gates the horses have? We have the walk. This one is a gate that it's compounded by four tempis. Um, we start with the right hind, this one, it's very easy to understand. We start with the right hand, then we go to the right front, left hand, right front. It's four tempis, tack, 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 tack. This one doesn't have a moment of suspension as the other gates. Then we have the trot. The trot is on diagonal. So when the right front, it's on the ground, the left one is also on the ground and vice versa. So left front on the ground, right, right front on the ground. In between these diagonals, we have a moment of suspension. Then the canter to the right, it starts with the left hind, then we have a diagonal left front, right hind, and then the last one is going to be the right front. Then after this, we're going to have a moment of suspension, just as we're looking at the image on the corner. The left canter is exactly the same, but in the different direction. So we're going to start with the right hind, then we're going to have the right diagonal, right front, left hind, and then we're going to finish with the left front with a moment of suspension in between the left front and the left and the right hind. There you go. Then we have the race canter. This one, instead of being in three tempi, it's going to be in four. Um, so instead of having this diagonal as we had on the canter, we're going to have, for example, on the right lead gallop, we're going to have left hind, right hind, left front, right front, and the moment of suspension. Wednesday, this is the one that the racing horses have, or when when your horse is getting loose and you're trying to catch it and it's just running away, this is the kind of canter and mechanic that the gate has. The, the gate, when, when the horse is moving, when the horse is putting weight on the limb, we have three phases. Let's talk about the trot that is easier for us to see the lameness on. We're going to have the first impact that is when the hoof touches the ground. Then we're going to have the second impact that is when like it's sliding and stopping. Like that is when it's actually putting the weight on the limb. Then we, ho we have the mid stance that is when the horse is pushing. And then we have the rollover that is when it's about to start everything again. We have a cranial phase, we have a stance phase, and we have a caudal phase of the gait. All of these things that I'm talking about, those are the kind of things that we look when we're looking for a lameness. You're going to have lameness that a horse is not stretching the limb as much or the, the amount of time that it spends on the ground is not as the same as the one that it has on the other limb or, or it's not putting the weight evenly on that hoof or when it's going on the back part of the, of the movement, it doesn't go as a stretch as, as the other one does. Uh, hopefully we can see this video. Let me just go out of the full screen. So this is a video from an app that is called Lameness Locator. You're going to see that the horse's limb has um, some dots. Is it a good, uh, is it a very good video because we can actually see the three phases of the of the of the movement. Like this is a trot. So we have diagonals. Then we have the cranial phase where the horse is stretched the stance and then the caudal face of it. I'm going to play it once more. Okay, perfect. And this one, so this is the canter. So this is just, uh, and, this is the first movie that was created. It was two guys in a in a bar, and they were like they were making a bet, trying to figure out if the canter actually had a movement where none of the hooves were in the ground. So one of them decided to take pictures, and there you go. This is how movies were created. So as you can see, the horse is completely stretching the gait, and we have the exact same faces: the cranial the stance and the caudal face of it. So I'm going to give you a very, very quick 
review of the of the lower limb anatomy, just because this is where we mostly see leanness on the real on the daily basis. So we're going to have the bone part of the limb that it's like let's start with the third phalanx, second phalanx, first phalanx. So the third phalanx is the one that is inside of the of the hoof that is a coffin bone. Then we have the coffin joint. Then we have the second phalanx, and that is the um. Then we have the pastern and the pastern joint. And then we have the actual fetlock that is the the, uh, the first phalanx and the metacarpal in this case because it's the front limb or the metatarsal if it's the hind limb. We have the most important uh, ligaments and tendons in that area are the suspensory ligament. We have the superficial and, and deep flexor tendons. Um, we have collateral ligaments. We have the extensor tendon at the front. And again, I can start, I can speak a lot about the anatomy, but I just want you to remember that if we don't know where we are, we don't know exactly what we're dealing with. So what does a lameness mean? Uh, UC Davis said it's a symptom that something within the body, within the limb or the body hurts enough that the horse alters its gait to control the amount of load that the affected limb has to bear. This alteration in load usually creates an asymmetric to the asymmetry to the gait. Not all the horses are going to show the lameness the same way. We're going to have horses that it's just a tiny, tiny cut, and they're going to be dead lame. And then we have we have these horses that can have awful things going on, and they still walk relatively sound. Um, what are the most commonly affected? Well, you need to understand that the horse's body. The front part of the body carries around 60 to 70% of the weight. And the back part that is the most powerful part of the body, the one that has the bigger muscles, it only carries between the 40 and 35% of the body weight. The joints that we most commonly see that had issues are pastern, hoof, fetlocks, knees, SI, stifles, and hocks. We can also have issues on the neck, on the back, um, shoulders, elbows, but these are like, let's go for the most basic ones. So what can be the predisposing factors? So for a horse to develop lameness, conformation, like I love this picture. This is a, a quarter horse. It looks like he's walking on toothpicks. Like you can see the hawks doesn't have any angle. It's completely straight. So the way that limb is carrying the weight is not correct and it's putting pressure in areas where it's not supposed to carry any pressure weight it's it's easier for a horse that has or like a body condition of eight to present weight um lameness issues just because remember the one that is carrying the weight is the hoof so just imagine that you're putting a lot of pressure in a tiny tiny thing and well at at some point that that is going to become painful. And if we don't assess it, it's going to turn around to be more like body soreness. Hoof condition, no hoof, no horse. Uh, the workload, the amount of work that the horses get is not the same a horse that has been trained to do long distance than a horse that just stays in the paddle. Like suddenly one day you decide to ride it and you go like for a trail ride for like four hours in hard footing. Well, that horse is going to get sore. And it's going to present some lameness, maybe. Preexistent illnesses, um, navicular disease, arthritis, um, some tendon tears. Even cushion can cause your horse to develop later issues. Um, diet and supplements. Here in Canada, we have um, a deficiency on selenium in the grasses that can cause us something that is called what muscle disease or like general weakness. And the soft tissues are not going to be as strong or they're not going to be as comfortable as if it was like in a normal environment, sorry, in an environment when we didn't have the, um, the selenium deficiency. Uh, footing is not the same to be working, like to be walking on Nikes than be walking on high heels, or it's not the same if you jump on a hard footing than if you jump in a very soft footing. The footing is also going to make us have different kind of injuries on the horse. 
Like it's more common to have soft tissue injuries on soft footing or deep footing than on hard. And it's easier to have bone joint related lameness on hard footing. The tack, the tack is also very important. If we don't have a saddle that is sitting correctly, if we don't have um, boots that are correctly fitted on our horse, we're going to start developing swelling on, on muscle soreness, and that can also predispose us to develop some lameness in the future. And I'm sad to say, but also the rider skills interfere a lot on the lame, on the biomechanics of the horse. Remember, when you're riding, you are not just the horse and the rider, you are a, a team, you are you are the two of you are together and if the rider has some issues like it's not correctly balanced or it has some musculature yeah musculoskeletal problems that can also be reflected on the way the horses move there there we have some pictures of the hoof like it's not the same to have a beautiful hoof than these ones again no hoof no horse so Is my horse normal or is it off? Is different to this. Is, is we need to understand and we need to distinguish between a body mover and a leg mover. What is a body mover? A body mover is this horse that is completely supple, relaxed, elastic. You can see the muscles moving freely all around. There's some swing. There's some floaty gates, and then we have this leg mover. The leg mover is this horse that is going to move. It looks even, but you're going to see that it's stiff, that there's a little bit of restriction and the muscles are not moving. They just look like if it was like a plastic horse, like everything is stiff. No, there's no free, there's no elasticity on the tissues around the body of the horse. Horses are amazing compensating pain. As I told you at the beginning, horses need to be ready to run. So maybe there's a little bit of pain, but we still have a lot of muscles, a lot of bones around the area that can support that area that is painful and continue going. For us to see a lameness, it means that it has been going on for a long time and it has been going subclinically. And when I say long time, it doesn't mean that it has been for years. It can be just a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Um, but the horse has been compensating. So when we start looking at a horse that is not sound, it means that that body has been compensating for more the time that it's it's comfortable. And, and it's causing him to just say like, you know what? I think I need attention right now. This is, um this chart is from the FBI. They they made a very interesting um, document about the importance of footing and the presentation of injuries, accidents, and lameness. We, at the center, we have the soundness and performance, and then we have the, the function, the actual function of the horse. We need to understand not all the horses are the same. It's not the same to evaluate um, a thoroughbred that has been on training all their life, and it's an eventer than an Icelandic pony that has different gates and it moves like it has a different conformation and it, it's a trail horse. So that's a function, the biomechanics, the coordination, the, the cooperativeness of the horse, the strength, the speed, the endurance. Now, then we have the intrinsic factors. Those are the physical, the way the horse is built, the conformation, the muscle, the genetics, the character, the, char the character is also very important. Just, just make a cute, uh, quick comparison between you and your horse. When you're stressed, when you're tense, you can even feel the muscles of your back getting sore. That's it. And it's different when you're very relaxed. Everything just goes by easily and you can move freely and you're more elastic. Then we have the extrinsic factors. Those ones are like the physical training, the, the care and the health that we give our horses the nutrition, the management, the breeding, how that horse was trained when it was young, it's going to make us, it's going to cause a lot of interference in the future. And also the environment, that one we can manage, but at the same time, we can't. So now going back to what is a lameness, 
what are the lameness signs that we look at? We're going to see if it's a lameness that is coming from the front limbs. We're going to see some head bobbing. So the horse is going to have the head coming up and down. If it's coming from the hind limb, we're going to have a dropped hip. Um, we can have increased digital pulses. Um, if it's obviously a non-weight bearing, we're going to see it. Pointing, a horse that is pointing is a horse that is resting the limb and it's just like putting it forward. Um, so they're going to be having weight shifting. And we, as I told you at the beginning, we need to see when is it at the impact, at the push-up or at the swing. So what are other lameness things? Inflammation and swelling. And this picture is very graphic. I, we can actually see where the issue is coming. Um, pain. Like you can be touching and say, like, oh, this is painful. Stiffness. Uh, non weight bearing, toy pointing, recluence or unwillingness to move, and asymmetry of the limb. Those are like the most common signs. What are the other subtle signs? These ones are the ones that we need to be more aware of. We're, we're used to see the most evident ones, but we are not paying attention to all the other ones. So if you have a horse that has some performance issues, like maybe it's not jumping, maybe it has some aversion of a version of going forward or has been developing some weird attitudes toward different exercise, those are signs that maybe that horse is feeling some pain. Horses that jumps, they're going to be adding a stride just before the jump or just doing like in a different, instead of doing it straight, it's going to be carrying it weights more to one side or even just continue with the lead after the jump or before the jump, horses that rush or horses that get very heavy after the jump, they are saying to us, there's something painful right now with me. Um, you're pinning, that's it. How those horses show us their, their emotions with the ears and the face, ex the facial expression. A horse that is feeling uncomfortable is going to put the ears back. Tail swishing, that's also a sign that the horse is feeling uncomfortable. And for example, there are some horses that have some hind end issues and when you ask them to do i don't know uh um a flying change at the canter they might be kicking out that's a way of saying like i don't want to do collection the kicking out it's mostly seen when you're asking for collection but also can be seen on circles can be seen when you're asking to do um lateral work so this is a very old picture from the pony club um books what can be the causes hmm. it can be a contracted heel it can be an avicular disease like this is just a small resume of all these causes that we can have saddle soreness knock it up keep a hernia like some of them are like small and other ones are very evident like i don't know how you're not going to be a word that your horse has a fissile on the withers. That is very painful and it's hard to treat because it's in an area that has a lot of mobility. But we have another ones like the ring bone when it's starting, it may not be very visible when it's actually active, that is going to become very painful until it gets completely calcified and fused. A toe crack can also cause a horse to be uncomfortable. Um, wind puff, side bones, like all of these are like the common terms for like the causes of injury, the lameness that we have. L we create the lameness from a zero to five. I remember one teacher explained to me it in a very easy way. So zero, it's a horse that looks beautiful, elastic, this Grand Prix horse that moves like a ballerina. Um, one, it's the hardest grade at all because it's hard to see. It's not very apparent. Sometimes only the rider sees it, um, but it needs to have a uh, like more, we need to be more aware of it to realize there's a one. Um, you can, it's more evident sometimes under saddles in circles when you do a different exercise. In comparison to the two, it's the lameness is difficult to observe at the walk, but it's visible 
in a circle at the trot. The tree is consistently observable on a straight line at the trot. Then the four, it's evident, the lameness is evident at the walk. And the five, it's a lameness that there's no weight bearing, okay? So the five is like that horse that is not putting any weight on the limb and is the one that it needs immediate assessment. Nowadays, we can use a 0.5. So if you ever see one of us putting on our records 1.5, it means that it's a one, but it's almost a two. Um, so that's how we grade it with a 1.5. So I'm going to play these videos and I want you to tell me if you see if this horse is lame, okay? Mm. Okay, this is an exam on a straight line on hard footing. And what we're looking at, it's a horse that is evidently doing a head bobbing. So when we, you see, whenever the horse is putting weight on the right limb, the, the head gets higher. See, up, 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 there you go. So this one, it's a three out of five. Okay, it's evident that the throat on a straight line it's evident at all times. It's You can see with the lines on the back, how the head gets higher every time he puts weight on the right limb, on the right front. Okay, up, 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 up. Okay. Now it's on the launch line. When we are not so sure that the horse is lame on a straight line, we like to see them on a launch line because it puts more pressure over the joints and the tissues. See, even though he's going to the left, it's very evident that it's head bobbing when it's putting weight on the right. Okay, now let's go to the other side. Okay. So this is another case. Do you think this horse looks lame? Again, we like to do the ex the, the lameness exam on a hard footing. Um, you can also do it on soft footing. Like if you wanna do a full lameness assessment, you need to see the horse in different kind of footing, like soft and hard ground. So look at the faces of the stride on this horse. It's covering ground, it's putting pressure over the limbs. It's It just looks very supple. This horse is sound. So don't burn your heads, this horse is sound. <laughs> we can see the horse is moving freely. The horse, like even the tail looks like loose. See, it has good suspension time, it's putting weight evenly, it's moving forward and it, it looks well balanced. Now let's see him to the other side again. Okay. So this is how we normally do a lameness exam. So we see the horse on a straight line. We see the horse on the launch line. We see the horse on hard footing, soft footing. Um, and once we determine, we decide, well, well, once we observe that the horse is lame or we are not so sure about it, we start doing different exams more specific, like the flexion that I'm going to talk in a few minutes. 
So what are the signs of lameness on a dressage horse? A dressage horse is going to be maybe against the beat or is not going to be like accepting the contact or not going into this rain. Um, it's going to be short on the neck or maybe above the vertical. Um, it's not going to be even. A dressage horse is very evident when it's not even. It's going to be maybe more into the left side or the right side. Um, if we're talking about doing circles, you're going to see a horse that is not completely bending into the circle. It's more like drifting the hind limbs or just avoiding the flexion. It's going to have an irregular rhythm in a specific lateral movements. It's going to have rhythm when we ask to extend the gait, especially when we're looking at the trot on a medium and extended trot. As you saw the previous videos, our lameness assessments are mostly done at the trot because that's the gate where we can observe the shortness of the step or the issues easier. Um, short the step behind in the walk. The walk is one of the hardest gates just because it's easier to train a horse to do a fancy trot than train a horse to do a fancy walk. Um, you're also going to see an even height of the steps when they're doing the more collected uh, exercise such as the Piaf and the Passage the inability of collecting, as I told you before, stiffness of the back, or not putting the hind end underneath, like as asked when you're asking pirouettes. Um, horses that had some hind limb lameness, as I told you before, is going to be behind when you're asking for flying changes or difficulties on doing it on the tempi. And again, there's not going to be that freedom and elasticity that we look that we're looking for in the dressage horse. In the jumper, we're going to see that it's maybe not pushing evenly with both hind limbs. Um, or maybe they're leaving one of the hind limbs lower than the other one. It's going to be there's going to be a reluctance to turn. Uh, it's going to refuse to land in one limb specific or in both. Tripping after the jump, that's also one of the signs. Uh, difficulty in making in this, the distances in a combination. I had some clients telling me, so my horse has been having issues covering the two strides in between the combination. Now he's doing three. That for me means that the horse is not willing to stretch or just trying to protect himself and doing a little bit shorter and avoiding doing an over, um, like over exercising to jump over the obstacle. I'll turn the strike length. That is exactly the same thing, like just having issues getting into the combinations. Um, a horse that is avoiding to get deep into the fence or a horse that has a tendency to have the rails knocked, that's a horse that has, again, that is showing some signs of pain that are very subtle. Um, then we have the other horses, especially with the hunters that you ask them to fall into the right canter or the left canter. Horses that land correctly with the front limbs, but the hind limbs are like, they're cross cantering. Those horses are also telling me I'm avoiding using these hind limb because it's painful. Rushing into fences, that's also another sign. And the most obvious one is when a horse is start, starts stopping or refusing. So now what we do, my horse is lame. What are the next steps? The first of all, do not panic. What you can do before we are there, keep calm. Depending on the injury, the location, the severity and the cuteness is what you're going to do. Don't put yourself in dangerous situations. Like if the horse is very lame, it's very painful, it's trashing the stall, don't get close to it. Keep yourself safe. I feel like the like <laughs> the movie they put on the airplane saying like, put your mask first and then put it on the other person that you're trying to help. It's exactly the same. You're going to help your horse for that. You need to be safe. You need to be ready to do it. Don't risk and don't get injured. What you can do, you can do icing and cold hoosing. Icing the first 48 hours, it's very good to reduce the swelling. After that, it doesn't do a lot. Stable grabs, that means a stabilization of the wound. If you see that the bone is coming out, call the vet. <laughs> but if you see that it looks a little bit wobbly, just put a, uh, a grab around and just keep it as stable as possible. Call for advice. And we can also do some topical preparations like 
even the Voltaren that is a coconut cream or uh, fluorescing with DMSO that is a sweat um, preparation that we use just to reduce the swelling. Again, this is before you have the horse assessed. A lameness exam is going to be performed by a vet. It can, we have two phases of our lameness exam. It's the standing phase where we are the cross ties and we're just poking, flexing, twi twisting, touching, looking all around the horse's body. Uh, we That's where we use the hoof testers. That's where we touch the tendon, just like as Dr. Sam Molson is doing there. You see with one hand, she's grabbing the, the, the lower part of the limb, the pastern, and with the right hand, she's putting pressure on what she's doing. You're just feeling how the deep, the superficial, the, the deep and the superficial tendon feels and how the suspensory is. We can also feel the small splint bones on the side. We see if there's any swelling, if it's, there's any reaction to palpation. Then after we do that, and with the information we gather at this point, then we go to the dynamic exam. That is the one that I showed the videos. That is the horse in a straight line, in, in a circle, a launch line, in hard footing, soft footing. Then we start doing the extra diagnosis, flexing. Um, we How we flex is, we start with the low, lowest part of the limb, and then we start going higher. Uh, each region of the body has a different timing and a different way of flexing it. Then after that, once we decide maybe, okay, he was very positive to the flexion of the fetlock, but I'm not sure if it's a little bit lower like the pastern area, then we start doing the freezing. We start using freezing um, medication just uh, such as carbocaine, lidocaine, to numb that area and just to distinguish exactly where the pain is coming from. After that, we start doing the eye imaging that it's ultrasound or x-ray, depending on what we're looking at is what we're going to recommend. Then once we have a diagnosis, we start with the treatment and the prognosis and the rehab. So here we have the first picture where there's how we use the hoof tester. The hoof testers are good to put pressure over the shoe, the nails, the wall, every structure around the hoof. It's also good to distinguish between um, when you have when you have a horse that has contracted heels and you want to know if there's some navicular pain on it, or when you have a horse that has uh, laminitis, it's going to be very sensitive at toe. Um, there are there are a few situations that can cause you to have a five out of five lameness. One of it is going to be like the most evident is going to be a fracture, a complete avulsion of one tendon or rupture of any soft tissue, but also a hoof abscess is going to cause us a five out of five. So that's when we use the hoof tester. Um, on the upper right, you're going to see that's a flexion. That's a full hind limb flexion. They're flexing the fetlock, the hock, and they're also lifting the limb close to the belly, and that is putting pressure over the hip area, SI. And at the bottom, obviously, there's a vet looking at a horse from behind. When we're doing the lameness assessment on a straight line, in my personal case, I like to see the horse from behind because I can see the hind limbs, like if there's some unevenness on the hip. I also like to see it from the front because I can see the head and the cranial face of the front limbs, but I also like to see it from the side because I like to see how much ground coverage and the difference in between the limbs and if there's any difference in between the limbs, sorry. Regarding the extra diagnosis ultrasound, it's good for soft tissue injuries, x-rays, it's bone, but we, if you listen to our podcast about lameness, I, I use a very good analogy about why we need to use them both. Um, if you were born in the 80s, 90s, you're more than aware that we used to have these cereal boxes that were like 3D and they had the printed like red and blue things on the back and they gave us these 3D lenses. One was red, one was blue and we put it on together and we were able to see the image, the complete image. That's exactly how the ultrasound and the x-rays work. One is going to give us the bone aspect, the joints, and the other one is going to give us a soft tissue part of the limb. If we want to have a very, very complete image, that's when we send the horse for an MRI. 
So you need to trust us because we can help you get into like the correct diagnosis. It is challenging. I'm not, I'm going to be honest. Lameness can be very challenging. I wish horses will be able to say like, hey, this is where it's painful. Look at it. But they not, they aren't. <laughs> they can't talk. So we need to use all of our expertise and senses to actually distinguish a lameness and correctly diagnose it. It's not something that we are born with. It's something that we work on it and we get trained for it. Um, what, as I told you, we can use different methods for diagnosis. The most common one is using regional anesthesia that is near, like greasing the areas so we can actually distinguish where the pain is coming from. Then if we go for more specific methods, it's the radiology, the ultrasound, MRI. And if we want to be very inside of the situation, we go for an arthroscopy. This is more about this other diagnostics more about confirmation of the lameness and giving us a prognosis. So nowadays we are very lucky to have technology with us. This is uh, these are screenshots and this is a video from an app that is called Sleep. Um, again, it's just another tool that we can use to to see lamenesses. Normally, you take a video and it tells us so oh, your horse is moving like this. You can see there's a curve over there. Uh, Sorry, this the curve at the top. This one should be like the one at the back, at the bottom. You see, this is the hind limbs. This is the front limbs. You can see that this horse is lame on the right front because we don't have the same power, like same impact when the horse limb is touching the ground. Like it's shorter than in comparison to the left front. This app also tells us how many strides it's in the video, how many strides are um like the variation on it and it gives you these graphics again nowadays we have more tools if this is not something that you need to have but if you have a good video and you have a slow motion camera you should you can take videos if you're sending that video to your vet please 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 take the whole horse head bum limbs everything because if you send us just the foot we're not going to be able to see anything just send the entire horse as i told you we need to see the overall to distinguish where the pain is coming from. So how are we going to prevent and how are we going to treat the lameness? The main goal is to reduce inflammation and the pain. Once we figure out where the pain is coming from, we need to reduce and treat. We can use systemic medication. It can be orally, intramuscular or IV, or it can be intraarticular. The aggressive not how aggressive the treatment is depends on how chronic or how many changes we're looking at. The type of medication that we're going to use and the treatment to be used, it's also, it also depends on what we're dealing with and the acuteness of the situation. Nowadays, we have different medications, just as hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, glycosaminoglycans, non-steroid anti-inflammatories. We have um, the autogenous medic um, treatments such as Prostride and IRAP, um, the PRP that is a platinum-rich uh, plasma. Uh, and also we have the physical therapy and alternative medicine. Physical therapy or the complementary, complementary alternative medicine, it can be just rest and control exercise. That means physiotherapy, cold therapy, the ceramic um, um, boots, just like the back on track, compression, carol, um, the kinesio taping, massage, acupuncture, shock wave, um, the magnetic. Um, there's another, I, I just can't remember the name of the brand, but there's another brand that has blankets with magnets. PEMF and TENS, that means electrostimulation and laser. Um, we can, we see a couple of them here in the market. Uh, the Beamer, it's also like one of the most famous right now. But all of these, uh, it's going to give the horse more comfort. So you are going to maybe start with doing joint injections and controlled exercise. And all these alternative complementary therapies are going to give the horse more, um, more comfort. And it's going to 
make the horse heal faster, get back into work in a shorter period than if we just keep them on a stall rest. And well, that's everything right now. Um, I like to finish with this picture because this is how we deal with the lameness. Everyone is going to be looking in different locations. Like it's, as I told you, it is challenging. It's not very straightforward, but we need to remember that our main goal is to keep our horses comfortable and happy. So please pay attention to what your vet says, listen and be comfortable in talking with us. Tell us what you feel, what the horses look at. And if there's something that you don't understand, just ask us, okay? Don't go for Dr. Google, please don't do it. And, and yeah, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, Uh, can you tell us? Okay, perfect. So one in this exam, those three are non-sterile medication that hides the pain. Uh, so if your horse is currently getting, I don't know, uh, private cox, uh, the recommendation is to keep the horse without the medication for just uh, at least 24 to 48 hours. So we don't hide anything. And we are like, we, as I told you, it's challenging. And if you hide the pain, it's going to be harder for us to actually diagnose what is going on. So if you're having a lameness assessment, have your horse without any non-sterile or sterile anti-inflammatory. Just wanted to add in for anyone that came in um, a little bit later that if you do have any questions, um, you can just go to the bottom of your screen to your chat box and you're able to write a question in there that Dr. Viviana would be happy to answer. Perfect. Margaret is asking, my horse is diagnosed with ring bone and it's on private equine. Is there something else I should be doing? Well, um, it depends on how progressed that ring bone is. Um, and if it's a low or a high ring bone, Prevacine is a very effective and, um, and pain medication and you can be using it in a long term. Okay, it's a high one. So um, it depends on how progressive it is. Um, I will recommend you, if you haven't done x-rays recently, to do a series of x-rays to figure out how uh, the pastern joint is looking. And there are some medication that you can also use, such as Osphos, that is going to help just, it's a binder, a calcium binder, so it's going to help getting everything more control. Again, what happened with the ring bone is when it's acute, everything is swollen and the bone is just looking angry. Uh, yeah, it's, let me just write down, it's going to be easier, Osphos. That one needs to be, um, you need to talk with your vet about it. But what else you can do? Um, I don't know if it's birth. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. <laughs> um, I was looking for a pen. Um, yeah, that one should be given by your vet. Uh, my recommendation is before administering osphos is to pull a wellness exam, a blood sample to see how the kittens are working because not all the horses are candidate for using it. Uh, other things that you can do is... Um, prevent that area from getting um, direct trauma, such as hitting himself, just using boots when he's outside. And also just keep him on a um, correct schedule for shoeing or trimming. Because again, if that, if that hoof is not keeping the balance of the limb, that is going to be put more pressure over the area that is affected with the ring bone. Okay, so Julie, I have been working to grow out a crack, a toe crack for six months. Anything to watch for? Okay, so the origin of hoof craft is hoof imbalances. If it's dramatic, if, uh, is it coming from the top or it's coming from the bottom? That, that will be the first question, knowing where it's, this one is coming from. If it's growing from the coronet band, then again, I will recommend you getting some x-rays. Um, 
it's coming from the bottom. Okay, so that's better. So uh, this is something that you need to talk with your fairy about. Um, I love to take x-rays, that's a reality. <laughs> but it's a good way of having professional pictures of our horses. <laughs> um, what I will recommend you, cracks are mostly because there's some hoof imbalances and the way the wall is carrying the weight, it's not even. And that's, that's when we have it. If you have been dealing with this for more than six months, my recommendation is to take hoof balance x-rays and have a conversation between your farrier and your vet about balancing that shoe, that hoof and maybe thinking about doing some shoeing to keep it like more uh, like to distribute the weight evenly. Um, also, keep that those hooves in a correct moisture. Use products such as Hoof Doctor that is going to keep everything more elastic. It's just like when you have cracked uh, like nails that are weak. You just want to keep them moist and elastic, and it's exactly the same with the hoof. Um, so regarding uh, Maya, is there any seasonality to consider for treating lameness with something like Osphos? No. If it's a horse that is showing, I will say do it before the show season, and that's Dr. Alejandro talk. Don't miss it. It's the last one. I think it's in April. Um, but regarding treating it like at some time of the year, no, you can use it at any time. Um, it's, it's more about, you should not use it more often than twice a year. That's the thing with Osphos. If it's a short horse, I will say, do a lameness assessment. And it's, it doesn't mean that your horse is lame. It make, make a soundness assessment before the season to make sure that you're not having anything to deal with while he's showing. Um, Mary, how long can a lameness last after an abscess has drained? If the abscess has drained, it should be all, like the horse should be sound. If the abscess has drained and the horse is still unsound, that means that there's something else going on. Remember, it's not just the hoof. We have inside of the hoof, the coughing bone. And if the abscess that it's septic produce some inflammation or infection to the coffin, we may be dealing with a septic coffin. Um, if your horse has an abscess that drain and it continue to drain for longer than a week, again, we need images to figure out if there's like a deep pocket or if there's something else going on there. Um, I don't know if you've been treating with what you've been treating. Uh, sometimes some of the situation that I've dealt before is people that have been treating horses for abscesses. And once the abscess has drained, the horses are having like very moist hooves and they develop trash and that can also cause them to be sore. So it's just trying to figure out if it's too moist. If you have, if you continue to treat that abscess and it's still moist, I will think that you need to change from, uh, for example, animal index into, um, sugar dying um, um, poulticing or if it's not training anymore and there's no moist um, my recommendation is to have x-rays of that hoof to figure out if there's something else going on yeah well other one perfect um so before show season if you go for a full series of adequan, it's going to keep your horse comfortable and it's going to let your horse perform in the best way possible. Um, adequan, it's a systemic medication that works whatever the body needs it the most. So you may think it's the front limb, but maybe it's going to be working on the back. It depends on the horse and what it's dealing with. Um, the adequan, it's sold in boxes with eight doses. Everyone, uh, every dose is given every four days. It's an IM injection that you can do it by yourself. And we teach you how to do it. And it, it has very good results. It's not a magic cure. It's just to keep your horse comfortable and make your horse perform to the top level. You're welcome, Blake. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So I don't know if you have any comments, any more questions. Um, 
talk now or okay so Lindsay what can I do to reduce a horse discomfort in when they're starting having a vehicular disease um, you don't have a correct balance it's going to progress faster um, again have a good farrier keep an eye on those angles um, most of the horses if your horse has low heels I will work on that and just keeping like you don't want a hoof that looks like this you want a hoof that have support on the back and it's wide on the heels. If the heels are contracted, those heels are not going to work as a spring. And the one that is going to absorb all the shock, the impact is going to be the bone and that it's the navicular. And remember that just above the navicular, we have the deep flexor tendon. And if it's overstretched, it's going to put more pressure over that tiny, tiny bone. Um, Hannah. At, at, at what stage with chronically lame horse generous course of tree should you consider quality of life? Um, it's like it's a tree, so it's only evident at the at the trot. Um, how long it has been going on? Uh, is your horse having issues to stand up after he lays down, or? For me, it's more about everything else. Like if my horse having issues to eat, like to walk from one place to another, like from walking from the corner of the paddock where the water is up to where the, the round bait is, that will be a concern. Um, I think when I have a horse that is chronically lame with a tree, uh, I'm more considering more about keeping comfortable and just keeping it as a paddock pet. Again, it depends on what he was diagnosed with. It's different if you have something like a ring bone, like as we talked before, or like chronic arthritis, than a horse that had a complete tear of one of the ligaments. Um, the, the way that you need to keep that co horse comfortable is different in, e in each situation. Um, we have a very, um, a very good questionnaire about quality of life that uh, it's going to help you understand when when it's time to decide what are the next steps with the horse. Yeah, sorry, Hannah, it's it's a complicated situation and it's it depends. Each case is it's a specific. Um I would recommend have you tried doing uh private calls or some sort of maintenance to keep him comfortable. Again, I don't think that's a horse that is going to be a sport horse anymore. It's more about keeping him happy on a paddock and able to move around. Uh, are there any breeds that are more prone to having a vehicular disease? Mm, yeah, well, more than breeds, it's more about the, the conformation of horses that have big bodies and tiny hooves, those ones are going to be more prone to develop an avicular disease. Uh, horses that are downhill, so that means that the bum is higher than the than the front feet, those are horses that are carrying more weight onto the front feet, and those are the ones that are more prone to. Welcome. And if you, I don't know, if after this talk you have any doubts, please send us a message, send us an email, and we will try to answer it to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you understood everything that I said. <laughs> I know I speak very fast sometimes. And well, don't miss all the other talks. It's going, they're going to be very informative. They're going to have a lot of information. And we're going to save this one so you can see it later. <laughs>